Well, good morning. And as uh, Duncan has said, uh, today we're looking at the, the subject of uh, joy, the great Christian virtue of joy. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, uh, and peace. And as usual, you'll find it helpful to follow, follow on uh, with your Bible open in front of you. So, I mean, this was a great day, um, they're full of excitement uh, when the 72 returned from this mission that they had been sent on by Christ, and they're coming back, uh, reporting everything that had taken place, uh, and to say that they were excited uh, would be a, an understatement. Uh, to say that they were a little bit upbeat would be downplaying things to, to some extent. Uh, they were positively ecstatic. Uh, they were overjoyed with the success of everything that had taken place. Uh, they had been able to, to teach. They had been able to give Christ's message out to all the various villages that they traveled through. Um, people who had been sick had been healed by them because Christ had given them authority to do that. And even people who had been um, oppressed and were under the bondage of evil spirits, they had the authority uh, to cast these spirits out. You know, just in the same way as Jesus had done with Legion. You remember the man who was in the tombs. They also, they could hardly believe it, had been able to do that. Uh, the mission had been a, an amazing and astonishing success. They had kind of smashed it out of the park, so to speak, and you can almost see them as they come back to Christ uh, to report all of these things. And, and, and Jesus says to them, you know, as far as in particular their authority over the demons was concerned, that, you know, this was not just an isolated kind of occurrence. That through Christ, there would be um, total victory over the demon world and over Satan himself. In fact, he reminds them here that he saw, he witnessed Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's a reference back to when Satan was cast out of heaven because of the pride and rebellion of his heart. That, that angel of the morning um, who wanted to uh, ascend to the throne of God and to be like God and how he had been cast out. And it's a, an indicator of the, the final and complete defeat of, of Satan that will be at the hands of Christ. And he says, yes, isn't it wonderful, everything that's taken place here? And then he pauses and he says, however, nevertheless, I appreciate this has all been wonderful and this has been tremendous for you. But let's just try and put things into perspective a little bit. Uh, as far as all the reasons that you may have in life to be joyful, I want to point out number one in the ranking order. The most important thing of all. And he said, listen to this and let it sink down into your heart. The greatest reason that you have for rejoicing is this. Not that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the greatest reason of all for joy. Rejoice in this, that the details of your life, you as an individual person, if you placed your faith in Christ, on that particular day, at that moment, you as a person and an individual, that has been recorded in the presence of God, indelibly. That will never be erased or cancelled out. God knows those who are His. And your name as an individual is written in heaven. You know, I, you know the great gospel hymn, we'll sing it at the end actually, O happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. It's the greatest of all days. And I wonder again this morning if we can just reflect and challenge our own hearts if that is a day that we have had, the happiest day, the greatest moment when we experience the washing away of our sin, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, when we passed from death to life, because at that very moment, heaven noticed 
And at that very point, a record was made in heaven. Now, this is recorded in a few places, actually, in our Bibles. I'm going to give you one of the examples of that, which is found in the book of Philippians, and in chapter 4. And in that passage, Paul is mentioning a number of different people that he's writing to. Two ladies, Iodia and Syntyche, Philippians 4, verse 2. And then he says, Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, he just doesn't say that their names are recorded in heaven here. He says they're in the book of life. It's the book of life. The book that records those who have eternal life, who have passed over from a state of spiritual death to life, who will live with Christ eternally. And these two women, and Clement, and his fellow laborers, and whoever his, uh, his true companion was, we don't really know who he was, but, but that name is recorded there uh, in the book of life. You know, in the last day, when the, when the dead are raised to stand before God, this will be something that will be the focus of that moment. You read about this one, actually, in the book of Revelation in chapter 20. It's the great white throne. And it says there, uh, round about verse 11, that the dead were raised from whatever you know, their final demise had been, whether it had been in the sea or whatever, and, and they had to stand before that throne, and a number of books are opened. And then it says, another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And it says that if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire, the last judgment. You know, you see these pictures of that volcano um, erupting in Iceland, the lava flowing and, uh, you know, what comes up from the, the center of the earth, so to speak. Tremendously serious last days when the lake of fire will be populated by those whose names are not written in the book of life the last death, the second death. And you can just imagine the ranks of people who have been raised up and brought forth one by one and the book being checked and to see if their names are written there or not. Whoever's, whoever's name was not written there was cast into the lake of fire. A tremendously serious thing. And, and for, for the Christian this morning, to have this sense of relief and to have this sense of tremendous joy to know that on that day when I stand before Christ and by the way Christians will never be there at the at the great white throne our sin has been dealt with in Christ we won't have to answer for that but to know that your name is in the book of life gives a tremendous sense of relief that your sins have been forgiven. Reflect on that. Rejoice in that. That's what our Lord Jesus said was the greatest reason of all to rejoice, that our names are written in heaven. You know, that's not to kind of discount the fact that at times in life, there are not situations where there is real difficulty and there is real distress and sadness and we're not advocating that people go around, you know, looking, looking like the Cheshire cat with a great big grin on their face all the time. I mean, that's just not reality. That's just not uh, real life. But what we are saying is this, that despite the profound sadnesses 
and difficulties that some people are called to pass through in life, that underneath all of that, there, there is a deeper joy that can sustain us. That joy is a deeper and it is a more profound thing even than the difficulties and the problems of life. And there are a number of passages of Scripture, again, that bear this point out. One of the great ones from the Old Testament is in the last uh, few verses of the prophecy of Habakkuk. And Habakkuk looks around, and he looks at his own life, and he says this, you know, as far as you know, the farm is concerned, and everything has just been decimated as far as life uh, in the countryside is concerned. He says, you know, although the fig tree doesn't blossom, and there be no fruit on the vine. Although the produce of the olive might fail, and the fields bear no fruit, and although the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. For him, there was a deeper thing that sustained him. Now, you get this again in a number of places. If I was to take you back to Philippians, because Philippians is a great book as far as this subject of joy is concerned. Paul is writing from prison, and frequently he tells them, um, you know, we've got reasons for rejoicing. Somebody once said that the title for Philippians should really be Joy from the Jail. And look at how he puts it, for instance, in the first chapter uh, of Philippians. I'm reading now from uh, verse uh, number 12, where he says, you know, I want you to know that the things that have happened to me, the way that things have turned out to me, have actually served to advance the gospel so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Now, this, this, this could have been absolutely devastating for Paul. Not only is he in prison, but people are trying to make things even more difficult for him by deliberately preaching Christ with the motive of increasing the, the level of antagonism that people have for him. And you think, what a betrayal. What a betrayal. But Paul rejoices even in that. I rejoice that Christ is proclaimed. Now, if you were to turn over to, to James and to, first, and to first Peter chapter 1, what you find in these passages is that he talks about, they both talk about various trials. James says this, that, uh, you know, we should consider it pure joy when, when trials come across our life. And the reason for that is because these trials, they produce certain things. They produce perseverance. They produce Christian character in our lives. And they furnish out our faith. Peter says that, you know, the, the trials and the way that we respond to them, it, uh, it, it shows the tested genuineness of your faith. And so in both of these occasions, you know, to, to communities of Christians who are scattered and persecuted and have lost so much, they address this issue and they say, you know, we can actually have, in the midst of all of that, reasons for rejoicing because our, our faith is shown to be true and Christ likeness is strengthened and it is produced in our lives so yes it's the greatest reason of all to know that your names are in heaven 
And joy can exist at the same time and be stronger than the difficulties of our circumstances. I I want to point out from our passage something else, though. I want to say a little bit about Christ's own joy. you'll You'll notice that down in verse 21. It's not just that they return with joy, but in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. You know, we don't often perhaps think about the joy of Christ. You know, we sometimes sing about the man of sorrows, which he was. But at one level, I wonder whether there has ever been somebody who was more happy and joyful than Christ. Because there was never ever regret. There was never a sense of disappointment and failure. There was never a sense of a a bad conscience. You know, there there was pleasure in in doing the will of God, and, and he delighted in the law of God, and his father found pleasure in him, and that was reciprocated. And, and, and there is real joy in the Holy Spirit uh, as, he, as, he, as he prays and he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You know, well, why is he thankful here? The reason that he's thankful is because his message, the good news of Christ's message of salvation is, is open to all. It's extended to everybody. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that it's not just the wise and the understanding, you know, the important people, the privileged few, the people who are in positions of authority, the intelligent, that they grasp these things and they can take it. No, no. He said, the reason I'm so thankful is that, in fact, you have reve- revealed this unto babes, unto children. And and if you look at the comparable passage where Matthew talks about this, straight after it, he moves into that wonderful verse in Matthew 11, and Christ says, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, take my yoke and learn from me. You'll find rest for your souls. And this this is an enormous reason for joy as far as Christ is concerned, his delight in the fact that people, irrespective of where they are, God can open their eyes. Nobody is restricted. And the invitation is this morning as well for us to come to Christ. And that, and that will be a cause of joy in heaven. Duncan read to us that earlier on, didn't he? From the parable of the prodigal son about the joy in the, in, among the angels of heaven over one sinner that repents. You think of the joy of the father in the parable when his boy that he thought was probably dead comes walking up that road again and he's able to welcome him home and to embrace him. The joy of the father. There's a tremendous verse in the book of Zephaniah Uh, that talks about God and it says that God will will rejoice over us with singing. It's almost as if he's cradling a child in his arms and he's rejoicing over us and singing over us. I think the father in the prodigal son story was doing that kind of thing. And, And this is an attribute of God. The joy of Christ. The joy of God over sinners. People who have been lost finding their way back home through Christ uh, to Him again. And joy characterizes the presence of God. I mean, when, when the angels were sent to make the announcement over the hills of Bethlehem at the birth of Christ, at the gift of heaven, they, they said, we, we bring glad tidings of great joy. I mean, this is tremendous for all the people that to you is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. It says about the presence of God that, you know, there, is, there, is, there are pleasures at your right hand forevermore. In your presence there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore at your right hand. In God's presence there is the fullness of joy. Now, The converse of that is true. Where Christ is not, where God is not, 
there can never be true and lasting joy. I mean, the, the story of the, the, the man in the book of Ecclesiastes sums all of this up. His search for happiness, his search for meaning, trying to, to do it in this way or, or pursue something else, and it's all vanity, and he can't seem to ever grasp it. It's just like chasing the wind, and he never finds it until he realizes it has to be in God himself that that is found. And that is the, that is the witness, that's the testimony of our world remember hearing a quote about Peter Sellers, you know, the Pink Panther, Inspector Clouseau, uh, who said, you know, we clowns actually have very sad faces underneath our masks. And that is the reality of much of our sad world today. And can I also say to Christians who are tempted to, to be swept along with the attitudes and the values of our world, that, that sin can rob you of your joy in Christ. I mean, that happened to, to David. And he writes that Psalm 51 after, you know, his relationship with Bathsheba and everything that kind of just happened after that. He says, Oh God, you know, create in me a clean heart and restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And maybe I'm speaking to somebody today and you've allowed sin, you've allowed something that you know is not right to rob you of your sense of joy. And you need to do what David did and get on your knees and make the kind of prayers that he did so that the joy of your salvation might be restored again unto you. Now just finally as we close, I want you to notice a word that the Lord Jesus uses here. It's down in verse number 23 as he turned to his disciples again. And he said to them, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Blessed. He said, you're blessed. Absolutely blessed. You know, that word blessed carries with it the idea of, of happiness. You know, in the, in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and so forth. Oh, oh, the happiness, that's what it means. Oh, the happiness of the people who are poor in spirit. Blessed are your eyes. Oh, the happiness of you people. You, you are people to be congratulated. You are people to be applauded. You are people to be envied. You are blessed because your eyes have seen what other people long to have seen. And they, and they weren't able to. The prophets that, that looked into the future, that God revealed something to them about the coming of the Messiah. And you read about this, by the way, in First Peter chapter 1 again. You know, that passage that Duncan read, where it talks about joy unspeakable and full of glory, because we're receiving the object, the goal of our faith, which is the salvation of our souls. He says there, you know, the prophets were trying to work out the times and the circumstances of the coming of Christ, about His suffering, and about the glory that then would be revealed. And, and they weren't able to work it all out. And he said, and, and even angels, actually, they long to look into the things concerning salvation, and, and they haven't the insight that you people have because the gospel has been revealed to you. Now that was true for the disciples but it's also true for people like us who come with our eyes opened by God's Spirit to see the greatness of Christ, our own weakness and the need to place our belief and faith in Him. You know, we're, we're blessed if we can do that. As I was thinking about the fact that the angels you know, they, they, they long to look into this. My mind went back to an old hymn from years ago uh, that I remembered we used to sing. Here's a verse of it. It goes like this. Holy, holy is, is what the angels sing. And I expect to help them make the courts of heaven ring. But when I sing redemption's story, they will fold their wings 
For angels never felt the joys that my salvation brings. Reason to be happy. A reason to rejoice, to have joy unspeakable, to rejoice in the Lord, that the joy of the Lord might be our strength. Plenty of things out there, but here is the one. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven and that you're blessed by God if you have faith in Christ. Now shall we pray. Lord, we give thanks this morning for the good news of the gospel of Christ. That whoever we are, with all our frailty and our weakness and our failures, that we are welcomed and invited to come to Him. And it can be a happy day for us. A happy day when Jesus washes our sins away. Help us, your people, to rejoice in our salvation and to rejoice in our Savior, to rejoice in the Lord always. And for those who have not got the joy of salvation, Lord, may your word speak to their hearts and to all our hearts as we give our thanks this morning in his name. Amen. So we're going to sing as our final hymn, O Happy Day.